leave it to a Fajaka to Fajaka things up. All right, everybody, so it's time for an update, uh, regrettably, on the Fajaka and the tank mates that I thought would work. Um, as the title kind of says, they did not work. Um, so yeah, anyways, we're gonna do an update on the Fajaka and the cribs. Um, all the cribs are fine. One of them got injured. We'll get into that, we'll look at him, we'll go over how I treated him, or her, uh, for that matter, uh, to get better and be healthy and, you know, stay healthy, so. Um, and it's kind of, the treatment's not done, but we're through the worst part where things could have gotten bad. They didn't get bad, luckily. So, uh, yeah, anyways, we'll go ahead and we'll look at the Fajacas, and then we'll look at the Frigs, the, <laughs> the Fajacas, the Frigs, the Cribs, and uh, and then we'll go over possibly some new tank mates or tank mates that might possibly work. Um, and I don't think cichlids are, are going to be something that's going to work with the Fajaka, uh, especially if they're going to show any form of aggression or territorial behavior. So anyways, we'll get to the video. All right, so let's take a, uh, a look at the Fajaka's tank. Um, let's see where the Fajaka is. Well, she's in her normal spot behind the uh, Anubius here, which is actually, when I came in the next morning, that is actually where I found one of the cribs. Um, it was the, the larger, more aggressive of the three, the one with the bigger belly and the nice pink spot on the belly, was back there in that spot, just guarding it, like kind of circling it. And you can't blame her. When you look at how cribs breed, they naturally breed you know, in substrate, and before they breed in that on that substrate, they kind of like to burrow it out, and you just have this perfect spot with plant cover on all sides, and it's already somewhat burrowed um, out just a little bit by the Fajaca. So they pick that spot naturally. You can't blame them for that. Um, they're also not really from the same water system as a Fajaca, though you could argue uh, Maboos and um, the... Um, what is that other one it's called? The Mabu and the Congo Spotted Puffer um, are from similar water systems. Of course, the Spotted Congo Puffer is not really going to give them any, any grief. The Shoutenai, Shoutendai, Shoutenai Puffer. Um, so yeah, I was hoping that that would kind of play to, uh, to my benefit and you know, they would kind of understand that they shouldn't mess with that fish. Um, somewhere in the night or probably early in the morning, one of them, you know, got territorial with the Fajaca and got bit in the face. Now, we'll go ahead and we'll look at that, you know, the actual wound itself here in a little bit. But uh, after seeing that, I immediately pulled that fish out, put it into a quarantine tank, which we'll look at. And then the other two fish out into another tank where they can kind of just hang out at for a little bit until I figure out where their uh, more permanent home will be. But, um... Yeah, as of now, the Fajaca is doing good. I'll try and get some feeding shots. Um, so you can see I've got, got a, a mess of um, snails here for her. If she feels like coming out, i just dump them all in. I don't always get to watch her eat because whoops, I don't have the time to be here when she's actually hungry. So I generally just throw in a good amount of snails and... Uh, she gets to him whenever she feels like it. But uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at the cribs. All right, so here is the 20 uh, that I have that one single injured crib in, if we can get to him or her. That is the face bite. Let's move this, hopefully. No one decides to run. And you can see, um, oh, if I can get some video or pictures, uh, I did have to delete some storage in the phone, but I think I still have it. Um, of the day after, the day of, and like a few days after that even, um, of when the bite actually happened. Um, that right side eye was uh, was actually red. You could tell it took a little bit of a damage when it got bit. I mean, we're talking not even a millimeter below the eye. Uh, it took a bite and maybe a few millimeters above the mouth. If that would have gotten infected, it would, you know, she would have lost her eye. Uh, she might not have been able to eat. So immediately what I did, and I'm gonna set this camera down. Uh, immediately what I did was, um, 
Uh, I placed her in here and she got canamycin treatment. So there's my kind of canamycin schedule. This tells you when this happened. This happened the day after I put them together and uh, and uploaded and published the video. So uh, I dosed canamycin on the day of. Um, canamycin two days after that. Canamycin another two days after that. And then a water change after that. So that is two, four, and six days of canamycin soaking in here. Um, on the seventh or eighth day, uh, I noticed, or no, it was like the fifth or sixth day, I noticed that it was no longer as red, meaning the, uh, you know, because it was very red. You could see the red in the capillaries um, still visible, meaning no scar tissue had formed over those to kind of keep out infection. No healing had yet happened. Um, but on day five, day six, I noticed it started to get duller, it wasn't as red, and uh, basically there was scar tissue developing over those open capillaries, meaning it was beginning to heal. Um, so on day seven, I did a water change, you've got a 50% water change, and since then, I've been uh, dosing with, um, what is that stuff called? The, uh, the natural... I'm gonna have to go grab it. I have to dose it anyways. All right, so I've been dosing Melifix every day after that water change, and uh, I'll continue the Melifix for, you know, up to two weeks. So it's time to dose it now. Just two mils, one mil per ten gallons, and you can see I've got the uh, the big jug here, and I've been through a good amount. But um, I like to use Melifix, you know, prior to. Um, dosing like actual heavy med sometimes before sometimes after to kind of see if I either need to be dosing a real true antibacterial or if I you know kind of want to follow up and ensure infection doesn't set in after I dose with an antibacterial um, and uh, basically maybe I wouldn't have to dose something like Melifix maybe I didn't even need to dose canamycin I, I really believe I should have though um, you know, if I was, if I wasn't too, I could have done, you know, 25% water change daily and maybe it would have healed, but we have to remember I'm not in soft acidic water that this fish is used to. I'm in a harder, more alkaline water where bacteria can, uh, survive a lot easier. So that being the situation, I felt it was best to go ahead and put antibacterials in and also continue to follow up with Melifix just so I know that, um, that she has the best fighting chance. And then we can also see here, I threw in a few catapa leaves. We've got two large catapa leaves. Again, I want to add more humic substances to kind of ease any bacteria um, in, in its ability to reproduce and infect the fish's open wound because that is still an open wound. Uh, it's not nearly as open as it was, but it's open and it is still... Uh, more easily susceptible to infection until it really gets a good scar tissue over it and it can start to produce its own slime coat over that scar tissue protecting the fish. Um, and then another thing that I'm doing is feeding you know as high quality of food as I can which is normally live adult brine shrimp with the occasional flake and pellet to you know make sure it has a well-rounded diet. But um, yeah, anyways, let's take a closer look at the fish's wound as it is right now. All right, so here is what our wound is looking like, and you guys barely even notice it. I can barely notice it. It's, it's almost just like a, an indentation, but uh, day one, it did not look very good. Uh, it's, its right eye was at risk of being lost, and... Um, if I didn't treat it, you know, fairly fast or got infection, not only would have lost the eye, but it probably would have lost or at least gotten infection on its mouth, which can be the end of a fish. So, um, it went over well, as bad as it is, it did go over well and I was able to save the fish and it's now healthy. It got a, a brutal warning and it'll never have to get one again because I'll never do that again. But, uh, yeah, little buddy, you want to... You want to turn around and show us the other side? What's right there? That could be a giant worm. It's definitely not a finger. It's probably a worm. If you turn around, you get to, to bite it. If you're fast enough. No? No? You're not going to do that? Okay. But um, there you go. You can kind of see it there. Um, and it was fairly deep. I mean, any deeper and it really could have opened up. Um, 
you know, it, perhaps even the mouth of the fish, it would have a legitimate hole there. But uh, again, the fish got bit lightly, but seriously by the fajaca. Any higher or further to the left, and this fish probably wouldn't have an eye. Any lower, and it would not have a functioning mouth. Any deeper, I mean, it's just low enough to have not struck the brain, but I mean, any deeper, and it might have a gaping hole there, uh, hindering its ability to eat, so. The fish got lucky. I'm lucky the Fajaca didn't decide to just kill the fish, um, which Fajacas have good enough eyesight. I've seen mine just, you know, nail the brain of crayfish multiple times. Like it knows exactly what it's doing. Um, and it's been doing that to crayfish since the first time I've put them in. So Fajacas know what they're doing. They're smart. They're predatorial fish that look and size up their prey and, um, you know they they calculate where they're going to bite before they bite and in the case of this fish it got lucky um, that the fajaca did not decide to go a little bit higher all right so that is basically it for the video that's kind of what I wanted to cover here uh, I just want to be honest with everyone and let you guys know um, I, I did screw up here maybe it's not my fault but it kind of is um, aqua apprentice pointed out rightfully he wasn't sure that it was gonna work and dude you were right um, so yeah, that's something I hope I don't ever have to learn again with this fish. I was kind of hoping and, um, you know, getting your hopes up isn't always a good thing to do. Maybe it's okay to do sometimes, but, you know, knowing the way things work and, um, you know, really just taking calculated risks is maybe acceptable. And in this case, I did not calculate accurately the risks I was taking. I should have seen you know, within those first few minutes of putting the Crebensis in there, the way they kind of acted towards the Fajaca. And I saw that and I just, I overlooked it because I got my hopes up thinking, this looks good and I hope it works. And I wanted to put the Crebs in there. And uh, yeah, my Crebensis had to pay for my mistake. So I do generally feel bad for, for it happening. But um, yeah, I think I can get away with the Siamese algae eaters and hopefully I can get away with putting some rainbows in here because I would really like to do rainbows in this tank. I don't think I'll ever try another cichlid, but uh, I think rainbows in a mabu would look great and I think they'll kind of stay up and out of the way of the fajaca most of the time. Um, mine generally stay up into the tank in case like, I don't know, sometimes when I'm feeding or in the fish room and they really can't, you know, see me if I come in at night or their lights are off, they will kind of go down into the tank and hide. So. I just hope they wouldn't hide there if I ended up going with rainbows. But anyways, let me know what you guys think I should put in the tank. Knowing that cichlids are probably not going to be an option, um, let me know what you guys think. I'm kind of leaning towards Siamese algae eaters, rainbows, possibly roseline sharks. I think those might stay out of the way, but I personally don't have any experience with roseline sharks. If you could kind of tell me how a roseline shark compares to a Siamese algae eater as far as like aggression um, in, in behavior, whether they like to stay low. I'm sure they're midwater to top water fish, but maybe their nighttime behavior, their morning behavior, because when fish go to spawn in the morning, are they spawning on the substrate? Are they gonna wanna spawn like my cribs did here in the morning uh, in his little sleepy hidey hole? Um, or are they going to be more adapt to spawning up in this crypt and maybe those crypts in Anubius? So uh, if you guys want to let me know about that, I would appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'll see you on the next one. And yeah, no more screw ups in here. Um, yeah, feel bad enough as it is. But uh, anyways, guys, thank you for watching and uh, stay tuned because I have something else I want to announce. Um, it's going to be coming up on Wednesday, so you might have an opportunity to win in an auction, uh, 15 of my shrimp, some of my moss, some other plants, um, and uh, yeah, some cool stuff. I'm gonna do a shrimp and plant package um, on an auction for someone. So anyway, stay tuned for that, and I will see you guys on the next video.